I am so stoked. You know, I'm off to Denver for this great conference. It's the NEWH Leadership Conference, but I'm looking at my ticket and it seems like I got a middle seat. That was no accident, sir. Yeah, but I always get the aisle because of my status. This is much better. With this seat, you get the opportunity to sit between a man on the aisle who will snore the whole time and a lady who probably should have purchased two seats just to be safe. Well, at least I don't have to sit next to the lady with that service kangaroo. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast. I, of course, am Glenn Hausman. I'm so psyched that you guys are here today. Now, listen, I've been on the road. I've been doing lots of fun stuff, and I've had a little hard time getting some content together, so you may have noticed this show is running a little bit late, but that's only because I wanted to wait to uh, have a great conversation with a great person, and I'm today, I'm going to introduce you to a new person. His name is uh, Corey Nyman. He's with the Nyman Group, and I know him out of Las Vegas, and He's in the in the heartbeat of where everything is happening in food and beverage and hospitality. And, uh, you know, I love, I love talking to you guys in the microphone right now and having him stare at me awkwardly. It's a lot of fun waiting for that person to come in. But please make sure you like me on iTunes or just like me in your personal life. But go on iTunes, like the No Vacancy podcast. I could use your love there. Find me at Traveling Glenn. Pre- promote the show, tweet the show, let's get it out there. I love what you guys are doing and helping me build this community. Let's just take it a little bit further. Speaking of taking it further, this guy's taking food and beverage further. Corey, how are you, sir? Outstanding, Glenn, yourself? I'm doing great. I'm psyched to be here. And, you know, I'm really high energy today and pumped because we're at the NEWH conference here in Denver, Colorado. And it's been fun being part of this leadership conference. You know, it's every other year, and it's great to see the uh, design world coming together in such a way. But this year, they're bringing a little bit more food and beverage, so they brought you in too. I appreciate it. It is. It's you know, this is my first involvement with NEWH, and you know, being here in Denver, where I happen to go to, the, to school, I went to university, and I sit on a board at the University of Denver, the Fritz Noble School of Hospitality Management. I just have that's pretty cool in itself. I'm I'm very fortunate. I mean, we, I'm impressed just hearing you say that, it. It must be cool to feel it. <laughs> it. It is. You know, it being being an alum of the school is one thing, and then being asked to be on the board to start with. I'm a founding member of the board. There was no board. Wow. And we're a great, you know, really, really diverse group of characters. There's about 18, 20 of us. And it's really been, It's we have a meeting every quarter. It's enlightening for me to come back to Denver, a place I love, a place I care about, Colorado as a whole. And for the years since I've graduated college and be able to come back every year and see the growth in this state, I mean, this is the heart of hospitality right now. I mean, I happen to live in Las Vegas. Wait, wait. Yes. Hold up. You're yeah. telling me Denver's yeah. the heart of hospitality well, right now. Denver and Colorado are the heart of hospitality for a couple of reasons. Because first of all, the impact of great sunny weather, the impact of marijuana. 350 days of sun a year. 100% more than Miami. Amazing. It, it's great. And so... Many years ago, people were moving from the East Coast to the West and going to Texas, going to Arizona, going to California and L.A. and San Diego, and they still are. And and that's all going on. But the fact is you can be in the middle of the country. We have a fantastic airport here. It's in the middle of Kansas almost. I I love that they built this new airport. Uh, They got rid of the old one. They built a brand new one. But boy, is it far away. It's far. But now they have a train. They actually have an air train that goes from the heart of downtown Denver at Union Station, which was totally redone, revitalized. It was a decrepit disgusting area and they were great restaurants there's a hotel there there i mean there's changes that are happening here and because it's the boom it's the you know the gold rush once again where people and if you look i think you mean the green rush it is the green rush (laughs) but if you look around downtown and you you see these high rises these condos these pop-ups i mean these neighborhoods there's just so much happening here and the restaurants are following where many years ago we could talk on food and beverage where probably the 80s and the 90s you had a lot of in Dallas, in Frisco, in some of the, the Texas areas where chains went to, to really start one or two restaurants. They wanted to see how people perceive them, whether in look, feel, taste, whatever it was. That's happening in Colorado now. People are launching concepts here, and they're really saying, oh, let's try this market. And then you're having these concepts that exist here, and they're going elsewhere, which is really fantastic. I mean, we can't forget Chipotle started in Denver. I did not know that. Yes, sir. It actually started two blocks from the University of Denver. That's interesting. Yep, early 90s. And it started in old Dolly Madison. Huh. About 800 square feet. <laughs> that's pretty cool. And that, and just, But that's one of those things. And there's other concepts that do that. So when I talk about hospitality and the heart of hospitality, there's a, there are a lot of things that are support services to that, right. whether it's limited service, full service, the wineries that are going on, the cannabis, the beer, and the farmer's markets. I mean, there are neighborhoods here. I mean, obviously, nothing's going to take the place in New York, Chicago, in San Francisco, right. and, and that's great. But there's so much that's actually occurring here in Colorado. So being that NEWH decided to come to Denver, show off the city, which is huge, 
really take another tact of leadership, right. take another the idea of bringing in more food and beverage of, okay, we're designing these spaces, public, private, restaurant, whatever it's going to be. How are they being impacted upon by consumers? And what are consumers telling us about what they want, whether it's in a restaurant, whether it's in a room? How are they going to use it? Where if it's like, you know what, now we've got you know the family of four who's traveling together. We need to have two double-doubles. And what else needs to be in the room? Because we've got four iPads now and we've got these many telephones. So, we hey, we need more phone chargers or we need a panel. We need a strip. Or, you know what, family's going to go out and instead they're going to go – dad and mom are going to bring a bottle of wine. They're going to bring in food for the kids. We're going to snack. Are there comfy spaces here? Right. So it's really try, and then it goes back to grab and go. I mean, grab and go is a huge trend, and we continue seeing. I mean, you name the market, every hotel is adding a grab and go. Whether it's taking the place of a breakfast or lunch restaurant, whether it's a coffee shop, you know, bringing someone like Starbucks or doing it branding their own, or they say the idea like, you know what, I'm going to keep it open all day, and my grab and go is not only going to be coffee, tea, snacks, but oh, I'm going to do beer and wine there. I'm going to do sandwiches. Yeah, I love that because as a uh, solo business traveler, mm-hmm. a, a lot of times I don't really want to go through the hassle of having that whole restaurant experience. I really do like grabbing something that I know is going to be a high quality food item, right. and then go back up to my room and not have to talk to anybody. One hundred percent. And I mean, prime example this morning, I was at. Let's call it a three-star hotel. Stay there. Perfect. Room was fine. Shower was hot. Bed was comfortable. That's all I needed. There was a full-service restaurant. I really wasn't in the mood to sit down. You know what? I went down the street. I found a Starbucks. I had a quick little snack and a cup of hot tea. I was very happy. And my in and out was 20 minutes because I wanted to make it longer. I could have been in and out in five. Right. So it's really about the kind of experience we're desiring. It's like, hey, we all have places to go. We all have things to do. And you know what? You say, hey, I want to get back to the room. I I have work to do. Or I'm going to a conference. I have 15 minutes. You can't do that in full-service restaurants, nor should we want to do that in full-service restaurants. Right. I mean, it's a different type of experience that you're seeking. 100%. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're really seeing, you know, the highs and lows of it where the fine dining, high dining, that's going to be there. The middle dining is going away. The lower dining is or the quick serve. That's still here or the quick experiences. Would you um, classify uh, quick serve like grab and goes as that fast casual concept or is it something different? 100%. I I think fast casual in there, whether it's a sweet green, a Chipotle, a mod market, uh, a pizza rev, any any of those where it's – all it is, quite candidly, it's a conveyor belt system. Right. You're, You're walking in. And it's assembly, and that, and it, it works. I mean, talk to Henry Ford. You know, it went, and instead of saying, all right, we're going to have a black Model T every single time, say, oh, you know what? I don't like olives. You don't have to put olives in my salad, but I can add in, or can I add in? There's a cost for everything. That's the beautiful thing. Right. We've got a baseline. I mean, with, great example. I mean, I look at someone like Pizza Ruff. I love that concept. I've got nothing to do uh, with I've, it. I've heard of it, but I bet a lot of people don't know exactly what it is. Could sure. you explain it? Sure. Pizza, I first discovered Pizza Ruff in Southern California, and basically it was the idea of, just like a Chipotle, where all the ingredients are laid out. I'm, I'm sorry to laugh because uh, it reminds me of that Seinfeld episode. Yeah, one hundred percent. And the funny, and you walk up and you can choose your dough. You can choose your pizza dough. If you're gluten free, they've got that too. They'll do it separate. And you can make, and it's one price. That's the best thing. You can throw anything that they have on your pizza. There's no charge except if you want double meat. But you can just put it on there. And so if you screw it up, you screw it up. But you're right. gonna be proud of it. Yeah. And if you <laughs> and if you want to make a cheese pizza, you can do that too. And literally, it's just a conveyor belt system. And they're putting it on sauce, cheese, meat. Eat, veg, everything. They bake it. It's out in four to eight minutes, mm-hmm. give or take. And you have this hot, fresh pizza in front of you. You can, and they've got beer and wine, by the way, so you can't forget it. They've got you know the Coke machine with the hundred flavors. But if you want a beer and wine, it's probably between four and six dollars. So you've just made date night for people. You've just made after school meals. That's interesting. I never thought about the uh, date night component of it. But I, I think maybe even younger people are not as focused on that high end experience right. constantly. It's more about uh, connecting in more personal ways and. The atmosphere just serves as a backdrop, not as the uh, main course. You're right. And, it, and then it's mine. I made it. Someone yeah. made it for me, but it was my decision. And then you look at the decor. It's blonde woods. It's stainless steel. It's big windows. And it's good music. I mean, nothing offensive. And it's colorful and bright. And all these things are going on. But if you said, and they do, a, they do meal deals. I mean, I walked into one the other day. It was four pizzas and four desserts for $40. And you could, and mom could get it, or dad could get That's it. That's unbelievable. It's a, it's amazing, and you can get it, bring it home. You have your own wine at home, and you're in your comfortable chair at home, your comfortable couch, whatever it is. I think we're going to see a lot more people nesting once again. Having ex- people are all about experiences, we know that, but being able to be at home will never go away. And now well, we saw it after September 11th, where right. people started nesting. Well, uh, yeah, and um, I, I think what happened after September 11th and was heightened with the Great Recession yes. was that. 
sense of materialism isn't necessarily the way to go. It's all about connecting with each other uh, intimately one-on-one. I don't mean sexually. I mean emotionally. 100%. And um, that's right. I think the nesting plays a part of it. You see it in um, the the birth of family suites in in the hospitality realm. Definitely. But you see it as people wanting to make their homes the place to hang out as well. Oh, that's it. And, you know, being that it's – Dual generational or tri generational? We're seeing a lot of tri generational again, where it's grandma and grandpa yeah. hanging out with with parents and the kids and having that experience at home. Whether it's the movies, whether it's cable, whether I mean not connecting, or whether it's having you know we've got a backyard, we've got a pool, but we're together right. and we're having that chance to be the one on one because we are so connected with technology that we are and we talk about this all the time in the industry where it's technology, technology, technology. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Technology can never take the place of hospitality, mm-hmm. and technology will never take the place of a one-on-one experience. And that's what I think we're going to find more and more because we can talk about generational gaps, which is BS in some regards and true in others. Right. In every generation, there are characteristics of another generation. That's what gets lost in this whole labeling method. That's right. And it drives me. It drives me crazy. Um, especially uh, one of the things that I say very frequently um, in my speeches on stage is that the focus on millennials is a red herring. Right? We've tricked ourselves into believing that they're so much different than us Gen X guys or the baby boomer right. type people. But you know, there's a flow through. We all want the same things in right. life. It's just that we connect with different elements in a different way. And I think that the millennials, they pick up technology quicker, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that the rest of us are inept and have no interest in the same things Correct. that they do. Right. And I think with that, the best thing about gener- generations, each generation shows us something different. And that's great. Where Gen X, we came in and said, hey, boomers, you were wonderful. It was awesome. We're looking at a different perspective. Right. right at the CEO complex. But there are those people in that generation too. And then these you know, millennials – yeah, we can lump everyone together. We shouldn't lump everyone right. together. But the chance is, okay, they're going to just give us a different perspective. They want experiential. Well, I want experiential too. Right. Doesn't mean I want to have materialistic the entire mm-hmm. time. And then Gen Z, they're like, wait a minute, we're coming back to it. So instead of saying, hey, you know, now I want direct and, you know, instead of in my face all the time, it's like, I want to have that one-on-one. I want to have this moment in time. It's like, okay, well, I can look at it on my phone or I can snap it, Instagram it, Facebook, whatever you want. But what about the in-person moment? Right. And that's where I think we're going to keep going back because as we can talk about life and government and technology and all these things, but nothing will ever take the place of human interaction. Nothing will ever take the place of the chance that someone can do a one on one experience and I can feel good or I can feel terrible or something's going to be there. You made me sad. You made me happy. And you have that. And food and beverage has that chance to really make that difference. And one of the things that we've talked about off mic is the idea that food is the one thing that we really can't turn into a technology thing. Sure, you can have an iPad to order from. But I'm talking about the um, the way that we connect to each other as friends, as family, as you know, people just meeting for the first time yes. is more increasingly, I think, over food and beverage than doing any other activity. One hundred percent, and you know, being able to share a meal with someone is is timeless. It really is. And then you can discover so much about a person, their manners, their mannerisms, their culture, how they experience. Do they know this ingredient? Do they not know this ingredient? Is it a dish from around the world? And then we're able to go back and forth. These people say, wow, have you ever tried that? Did you have this? And then that emotional connection to the food. And then will our memory will be like, oh, you know what? I had that cup of coffee with Glenn and it was this pour over. We happened to be in San Francisco that day. It was on the corner. Like, wait a minute. This this is special. And so then we can look back, and then you're like, you know what? Corey and I had that coffee in San Francisco. I'm going to take the wife. We're going to go next time. And then it it just keeps ticking off. And then it's shared, and it's shared. It's not necessarily shared. You know, forget the social mediums and medias. We're sharing it. I was talking, you know, Corey, you're going to San Francisco. I got a spot for you. Right, yeah. You know, it's like, hey, you're coming to Vegas. Great. And we can talk about, and we'll bring it back to Vegas if you want. Oh, we will. (laughs) Good. But, you know, and and it's it's all about the census. Is it it senses or sensory overload? And we, we talk a lot in our organization, is it, is it good or good enough? You know, it, it's yeah. so funny when we talk about that. People are like, wait, what do you mean, good or good that's, enough? That's, I, I don't understand why people don't understand what that means. Good good enough doesn't feel like you have your heart and soul and passion behind it. Correct. It just feels like, uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, so t- you know what? I'll take a cheese, chicken Caesar salad. Okay. But you know, sir, I've got this great chicken. It was hormone-free. You know, it's free-range, and we make the Caesar dressing in-house, and I'm going to shave the, Caesar, the Parmesan on the table side, crack black pepper right in front of you, and it's like, wow, that's good. And so it, 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 it's, it simplifies it. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, is we don't ask ourselves that question enough, where especially in this industry, we forget about we can build these great restaurants, these right. great hotels. Who are we doing it for? You know, yeah, it's a corporate, and we want the ROI, which we need to have the ROI and everything we do. 
But the person who's in that room, the person who's in that chair, how do they feel? What experience do they want? And if, you know, we've got a single business traveler and he's not with his family, okay, he might be on his iPad, he might be on his tablet, and he's calling home through whatever technology, and he needs a comfortable chair to sit in. And he's like, hey, you know, we've got this family and they're coming in. They've never been in that city before. Okay, maybe I need lower table chairs. You know what? They happen. They don't have their charger. Do I have plugs for them? All these things that go back to hospitality and guest service. And those are two things that are not lost. They just need to be rediscovered. Right. And let me give you a little uh, fill-in on why uh, Corey here knows so much. The Nyman Group has been around for 35 years. And though you don't know them as a household name, the, the major players in the hospitality industry sure do. They've been consulting, helping, and driving the direction of food and beverage in the hospitality business for those 35 years now. So okay. you do know what you're talking about. We, we try. You <laughs> yeah. know, our, our whole thing is you know, we're only as good as our last project and we we never seek out the glory our, our glory is making sure our clients are happy make sure they get all the publicity and make sure they have a successful operation right so it's it's kind of like you're um like like me i do a lot of ghost writing and people have no idea that um it wasn't the ceo of xyz company that right. wrote it it was just poor little old me it's the same thing with you guys 100 percent. and for us it, we we're all about our projects and we we stand i mean Everything for us is referral based. We, you know, yes, we do speak, we do write articles, and we're very, very proud of that. But we're, we are still working with clients 20, 30 years ago who we've worked with, and they're referring us to projects. I mean, we have a client who we'd worked with 21 years ago who just referred us to a project. Wow. And to have that good standing, that name. I, I, I'm amazed that you did a project with someone 21 years ago and they went, oh, and remembered your name. 100%. I mean, that shows what kind of an impact you make. Well, and, you know, and it all goes back to our president, my father, Robert Nyman, and what he really said is the baseline. And his first consulting project was for A.N. Pritzker when he worked for Hyatt Hotels. And that was in the late 70s. Wow. And so, and really that set us on our way where we go through the same methodology. And yes, we, different technologies and different steps and different education and constantly improving because it's a lot different than the 70s. And we know that. But it goes back to the root of hospitality. We go, I mean, we ask the five questions. You know, what does what our guest need? How are we going to get this done? Why? All these other elements. And then at the end of the day, we talk to them saying, what are your expectations? And we want to make sure we do realistic expectations. We always set the dream phase. We always create the dream phase. That's a big thing for us. Say, if you were building a new hotel, if you're building a new restaurant, what would you want? How would you do it? Great. No, and there's no wrong answer for that. Right. Uh, Disney calls that uh, the blue sky uh, and part of the project where nothing is off limits. Let's Correct. dream as crazy as we can. Correct. And and we've got a little history with that tiny little company, um, <laughs> you know, which we really can't talk about. Sorry, guys. No, that's a problem with you guys. You really can't talk about it. I know. Exactly. You know, everybody, you've done everything, but you've done nothing. <laughs> right. Well, but, you know, the funny thing is we don't stand on ceremony, though. We're, we're yeah. always willing to have that conversation. You know, we're, we seriously are only as good as our last project. And, you know, I could go up and speak today in front of a couple hundred people. And that's going to be great. Don't get me wrong. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter until we work with our client and right. give them what their expectations right. are. And so, and we, our clients are diverse. We can create, we're creating a new steakhouse in one city right now. We're doing an analysis for a casino food and beverage program that has $70 million in total sales. Um, we're working with another project and looking, uh, analyzing, bringing a celebrity chef for them. And then we're looking at another one who's looking to bring a hotel to Vegas. So, and working on their food and beverage program. So it really just depends on where we need. And thank goodness we're Swiss army knives. You know, we've got these different tools where Robert really started in the back of house and systems and purchasing in culinary because he does have a nutrition degree from NYU and nice. culinary background I really is more the operational face in the front and then training and development and my brother Craig who's with us as well PR marketing and operations and you guys also might know uh, Craig Nyman from a previous show he happens to have a, another job booking all of the acts for the amazing life is beautiful festival that's held every fall in Las Vegas so I would urge you to go back into the catalog and listen to that show because it's a fascinating look at how do you touch into the next year's zeitgeist of who are going to be the hot bands and really understanding what an audience is going to want to see many, many months, even a year in advance? So pretty cool. Go check that out. Okay, back to food and beverage. All right. So <laughs> thanks. So in, in terms of food and beverage, you know, everyone say, oh, hey, what are the what are the trends? What do you mean? What are the trends? We can talk about the trends and I'm going to talk about the trends, but it's almost March. It's February. It's March. And we've hit quarter one. We're almost done. Right. Okay, where are we going at the end of the year? Where are we going for 18? Because all the – and a lot of fiscals are ending. So great. The planning's happening. It's already there. Where are we going to spend our money in? So we talk about what's hot. Again, limited service, quick service, bold flavors. We talk about Indian. We talk about Peruvian. We talk about Hawaiian. You know, these things – food that's – some of it's recognizable. Some of it's very recognizable. But then you're like, okay, what about this? Well, soy sauce. Okay, the whole gluten-free trend and allergens. People, right. And, I mean, we go back and forth and we keep going. Then you're like, okay, great. Where's food going next? Well, wh where would you like to go? 
And then we, I mean, we can talk about local all day and all night. And what does local mean anymore? You know, we talked about the local for movement. We talked about the slow movement. But local is like, is local in my town? Is local 25 miles away? Is, is it 100? It exactly. Yeah. And so is it regional? So it's really, we need to be, it goes in our opinion, it's truth and food. What is true about our food? And whether it's going to be hormones and antibiotics, whether it's going to be vegetables, whether it's going to be proteins, whether it's going to be new flavors, but what is it? Is it real or is it not real? Hmm. And so we and we keep taking that next level of where do we want food to go? Right now, speaking of where food is going to to go, one of the things I find is that oh, you're telling me X Y Z foods are going to be popular this mm-hmm. year or next year. Who's driving that trend? The people or the chefs? How does that all actually happen? There are a lot of prognosticators, and they're all around, and most times they're wrong. Yeah, they, they really. Some people are just pulling it. Except talking about chicken and waffles, because that's a great trend. Well, chicken, yeah, <laughs> Ch- chicken and waffles is a really good trend. Um, you know, and like I'll give you a good example. There, there was a trend that occurred last year, and it's been around. Nashville hot chicken, mm-hmm. and Nashville hot chicken's right, good. KFC had it for a while. I mean, it really, it was there, 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 and then exploded, and yeah. it's kind of faded but away. But that's quick. the funny thing, though, Glenn. Nashville hot chicken has been in Nashville and Tennessee for many years, and there are all these little hot chicken restaurants opening. All of them, one in Brooklyn, one here, one there, and then KFC hops onto it. Okay, well, KFC is a multi-billion dollar, with Yum Brands, billion dollar company. They did their research, and they rolled it out, and they did their menu development, recipe development, and then it went mainstream. So basically, hot, Nashville Hot Chicken jumped the shark. Right. So it's the same as, like, bacon. We can talk about that. I mean, yeah, bacon, bacon martinis, exa- bacon everything. Exactly. And do I want a bacon martini? No. Do I want a chocolate covered bacon? No. Will I try it? Sure. But some people who... And again, this is the funny thing. We talk about the coasts, the middle of the country, and where trends and yeah. food goes back and forth to. Some people are still seeing this for the first, first time. Some right. people have not had – some people don't know what Hawaiian poke is. That's unfortunate. Of course it is. But in true Hawaiian poke is fish that's been marinated in the shoyu and the soy. And it's got the onion and the green onion, the sesame seeds, sesame and all that. Great. The trend right now are poke bowls. They're not poke. Right. It, it it's great. It's fish in a bowl with sauce that's been mixed real fast. Yeah, yeah. True poke has to have the fish slightly marinating and sitting in flavor so everything comes together. So that's one of the trends of this is a trend that's actually happening. Bowls. Food in bowls. Yeah. I mean, we did this three years ago. We created a concept which we won an award for, and it was amazing, but now it's it's just a vessel. Whether it's rice in the bottom or noodles or lettuce, whatever it is, it's just another vessel, just the same as bread is a vessel. Right. And sandwich shops. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a convenience food at this point. But in, in, in order put, – put, putting food in a bowl, it's the, it's the conveyor system. It's right. the same idea. So, great. You get to pick all these things that go on top of it. And yeah. there are these themed bowls they might have in every venue or themed rest- sandwiches, but you can create your own. So that's a trend that's sticking. Interesting. So we're talking about that idea. You know, one of the constant themes I talk about is mass customization. And you're playing into that whole theme, being able to design something specifically to your likes. It's mm-hmm. pizza or ramen noodle soup or whatever it might mm-hmm. be. So that's, that's fascinating to me. Now, how do you know or can you know if something's a trend or it's really just going to be a novelty like that hot chicken? Well, I think, you know, without, we're fortunate to travel around the country and travel around the world, live around the country, and, and we speak to people in different parts and say, hey, what's hot? What's happening? What was the latest restaurant to open? What was the latest restaurant to close? And then we, we're discussing with chefs. We're discussing with farmers. We're meeting with some of these uh, spice companies and finding their demand. I mean, we sit down with, you know, whether it's a grain company, say, hey, what do you get and what are you hearing from? Or what would you like to push? Or what, you know, what were you long, were you long on? You know, I didn't know that there were all these quinoa fields that happened to be in Alberta, Canada. No idea because quinoa came from Peru and moved up. Blah, blah. And so we discovered. And so it's really just saying, okay, what's been happening? Then you find that one chef who's doing it. Okay, ramen. Okay, why did ramen work? Ramen worked because it was flavorful. Cheaper cuts, quicker, went for years. And I find it to be light. You don't feel weighted down like all those burger joints. Correct. And so, but you could also customize ramen. But at the same time, why did the base of ramen, you had to make a soup or a proper stock for how many hours? 12, 18, 24. So it was preparation. Right. So it's really making sure, okay, I'm going to have this quick food for you, bowl of ramen, two minutes, the noodles and everything, but... I'm going to take my 12 to 24 hours to make it so it's preparation. Right. So we go back to, I mean, great Vietnamese. Vietnamese is extremely hot right now. Yeah. Pho shops. Yep. There's pho everywhere. Right. And pho, for all of you that are out there that aren't quite sure, that's where you see P-H-O is pronounced pho. Correct. Very good, Glenn. Thank you. And I'm, I, I just figured that out. So I, I'm very proud of you. Like I knew it all the time. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> very proud of you. But, but pho, in order to get that, that 
those rice noodles and depending on what vegetables you want in there or what meat, you have to have a proper broth. And in order to make a proper pho broth, it's 12 to 36 hours. And it's flavorful, whether it's just Vietnamese cinnamon or the star anise or whatever. And everyone's got their own style, but that has to be prepared in advance. They're going to serve it with, to you within two to five minutes, but it has to be prepared in advance. Just like these pizza concepts. You can't make dough in five minutes. You have to make right. dough and let it rise and let it rest and go through. So that dough process is going to take four to 12 hours. So we're talking about all these quick serve foods and great, and but we have to have it all prepared and laid out. Right. So it's quick serve, but long preparation. 100%. 100%. Interesting. But there has to be, so there has to be a method or a madness. That's really, so it's going back to all these, whether it's a banquet, whether it's a catering opportunity, whether it's a restaurant. How do I get to the service level? Because food just doesn't appear. We're not putting a magic pill in a microwave like the Jetsons and a 12, you know, course meal comes out that'd be great but truth in food someone has to bring in the food someone has to cook the food someone has to prepare the food someone has to set up the food guess what we also need labor for that right we need to make sure can we pay our people can we afford to pay our people who are working for us and can we staff a restaurant and we'll we'll see a huge sea change right now with all the labor and the labor changes and the the cost of doing business where do you think we are in terms of uh labor and the tipping system versus the non-tipping system and really being able to make restaurants survive because I'm seeing out there that restaurants are really getting uh, cut with rising food costs and rising labor costs and how are they making any money? 100%. I, I think that, you know, we used to joke, you know, restaurant business is a business of nickels and then went to a business of pennies and now it's a business of fractions of pennies. Wow. Yeah. It, it really is. I mean, our margins are so razor thin at this point. You know, you look look at any major city, their restaurants closing down left and right, whether it's because leases are going up in cost, whether it's because labor and I can't afford to pay someone. Probably a combination of all of that kind of stuff. 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at a great example. You just look at McDonald's and what they've done. Kiosk ordering. Yeah. You know, I spent, we spent some time in Canada doing work on projects and every single McDonald's up in Canada currently has kiosks. I have order. not yet utilized that at McDonald's. I don't know if it's functioned to me not typically visiting mm -hmm. McDonald's. Right. Which I, I, I do love the good McDonald's breakfast at the airport. Everyone does. Um, but... Um, I do worry for the labor pool in the country that we're going to get to this automation point and lose some of that, that personal contact. We're there. We're, we're there right now. I mean, a good example is if you go to JFK, go to LaGuardia, go to Philadelphia, any of those yep. big airports. Yeah, OTA um, it has really done a great job at uh, taking out a lot of the labor and making everyone order on iPads and right. they'll deliver it to your table. Correct. However, there's a problem, and that's great. Forget the human interaction because that's the biggest thing. But mm -hmm. good example is at Philadelphia International Airport recently, went to this restaurant and I was in a smaller terminal, saw the kitchen, everyone's cooking, saw the menu, looked great, sat down. The menu on the tablet was different than the menu was on the board. Oh, come on. Dead serious. So first of all, so now I'm disappointed. So then I try to place my order, place my order. Food comes out. I wanted the, I ordered sweet potato fries. They come with ketchup, said, excuse me, they came with a sweet sauce and whatever. Dish comes out, comes with ketchup. I can't have ketchup. I'm allergic to tomatoes. Oh, my God. I, I know, I know. But- then I'm like, hey, can I have Dijon mustard server? It's like, I'm not your server. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. hey, oh. So then, it, and I'm on the end, I'm close to the kitchen, and it took three people before I got some Dijon mustard for the, my sweet potato fries. And I'm, I'll leave out some other things, but the idea is, my concern is, what happens when I need a glass of water refilled? Do I need to press a button on a tablet? I'm sorry. And, and I understand right. the idea of an airport, and airports were always special places to me. Airport, the idea you're going one place to another, it's it's a magic journey. It really is. And just watching those airplanes on out there on the tarmac or taking off is just, oh, I'm I'm in my 40s and I still right. feel like a six-year-old and get so excited about it. Right. And But the thing is, I want to go and, yeah, maybe I'm going to get a Caesar salad and sweet potato fries and I'm going to get a glass of wine. That's fine. Next thing I know, it's a $50 check. I want some service. And whether it's on a business, you know, and I'm using it as an expense or it's a personal, I want some sort of experience. I will tell you if I don't want an experience. And that's the thing that we've lost a lot in our culture because of labor, because of technology, what it is, the human interaction. Where you're in an airport, you're online for Starbucks, you are just a number. Right. You're just a number. And, you know, it's funny. We're almost throwing a banquet nowadays in everything we do. <laughs> you know, yeah. How many chickens do I want? How many beefs yep. do I want? How many vegetarians? And so just get them out the door. Yep. And so it's a volume quotient right now. I that's kind of that's kind of scary. All right. So I do want to go back to tipping versus non tipping. Yes. What are your opinions on? Um. That? You know, I don't personally like tipping being included in the check. I understand why operators are doing it. And as an operator, if I did it to offset what I have to pay my, my staff, I'm all for it. Right. And I should set this up by saying there's a huge disparity between back of house pay yes. and front of house pay. And it's really hurting the industry in the sense that a lot of great people that would have become great chefs 
would rather just go and be a server because they can make a lot of money. It's true. And I mean, listen, I remember managing a restaurant and making $30,000 a year and my servers were making 100, 120,000. Holy shit. As a server working 35 hours a week. Wow. And it, it's tough to digest. Um, so I think right now there is a huge disconnect. And I have cooked. I have spent time in the back house. And there was always that disconnect. And so we either make the decision to pay people more, split the tips, or figure out what we're going to do. And right now there are enough people coming out of culinary school who have forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in debt who can't get a job. Right. And those are the types of people that I'm specifically talking about right. that want to be back a house. but. They can't be. You're right. And I think some restaurants are, are getting it where they're putting everyone on the level playing field and they're sharing in right. the tips and they're sharing in the revenue. And I think that's great. And I think, but it, it doesn't fit every restaurant. Yeah. So you've got to really think it through. What's your model? All of that kind of good stuff. Correct. Now, we got a problem, Corey, because you've got a panel to do. I do. We've already done a half an hour on here and we didn't even get to talk about Las Vegas. We didn't. So I think what we're going to have to do is have you come back on a, another show and, and talk about that kind of stuff. I found this Done. to be absolutely interesting and super duper uh, fascinating. I love your perspective on things. I appreciate it. Well, I look forward to speaking again. But more importantly, uh, you've got to give a shameless plug. How can people find you? Tell them, tell them all that good sure. stuff. Sure. Well, thank you for that. It's very kind of you. So the Nyman Group, the T-H-E-N-Y-M-A-N-G-R-O-U-P. TheNymaGroup.com. You can also find us on Twitter, the Nyman Group, at the Nyman Group. You can find us on Facebook, or you can call me directly at our business line. I'm not giving you my personal line. Sorry, guys. Uh, that's a shame. I know. I, I know apologize. there's a lot of ladies out there that are looking forward to calling you. You're very kind. But <laughs> but you can also get me on email, which is Corey, C-R-E-Y, at the com, Or worst case, just get us through Glenn and you'll find us. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, totally. Hit me up. I'm at Glenn at Rouse Media. You already know to find me at Traveling Glenn on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. And make sure that you tell your friends, your family, strangers on the street, all about the No Vacancy Podcast. I love bringing this to you every week and learning so much along with you guys today. Man, that was a lot of fun. Back to the NEWH conference. I hope you guys have a great day, and I will be back to you right after this commercial break. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast, will be right back. Hey everyone, this is Jeff from Endpoint Multimedia. You've heard me on the show give off lists of great travel tips and spots. Well now I'm going to give you my super secret beach vacation spot. Villas Hermosas is just steps from the beautiful beach of Playa Hermosa in Costa Rica, which is close to Santa Teresa and Malpais. I've personally been going to Villas Hermosas for seven years now, and the owners Brad and Tara treat their guests like friends. And no matter what your interests are, they'll lead you in the right direction. The reason I love this particular part of the country is that the southern Nicoya Peninsula is more untouched and uh, raw than some of the more well-known tourist destinations of Costa Rica. But don't let that ruggedness fool you. You can be pampered as much as you'd like at Villas Hermosas, and the restaurants in town are simply amazing. So whether you're looking for true solitude, an adventure vacation with zip lining and quad tour, or a great surfing destination with super consistent waves, Villas Hermosas is my personal recommendation. Check them out, villashermosas.com, and let them know you heard about them from us. Enjoy the rest of the show. Excellent. So I got to... Got to warm up to this interview because I got to tell you folks out there uh, listening, I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit scared. That's right. Because I'm talking to someone who doesn't know this, but believe it or not, I was very intimidated as a young guy entering the hospitality industry to even talk to this guy, let alone interview him. And this is my first real genuine conversation with Mr. Uh, Tom Corcoran, who's the chairman of the board with Felcor Lodging Trust in my uh, more than 20 years in this business. Uh, Tom, very sh- strange that of all people, I'd be uh, freaked out by you. Yeah, because I'm not known as being scary to most people. No, no, I, I straight. <laughs> the more the more I get to know you, the more I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? And it just it just makes us realize about how far up in our own heads we can get sometimes, and how we could warp reality and what's really going on to fit our own personal narrative, which is a very strange thing to me. Yeah. 
Very true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I am here with uh, Tom Corcoran, and he is the chairman of the board of Felcor Logic Trust. And for a lot of you folks out there listening, specifically you, all you guys on my Road Warrior side of the audience, you don't have any idea who this gentleman is. But we're going to get right into that. But I want to say uh, he's also a Lifetime Achievement Award winner recently at the America's Lodging Investment Summit, which was held in Los Angeles in January. Uh, and he was given this Lifetime Achievement Award because... He has achieved so much in his life, building this company from nothing, starting in the hotel industry at the age of 14 and creating one of the first ever uh, REITs in the hospitality business. Uh, Tom, I'd appreciate it if you could share a little bit with us. Uh, what exactly is a REIT for those folks that may not understand this uh, basic thing that you and I take for granted? Uh, yeah, a REIT is a real estate investment income trust. It was actually, it's, it's, it exists under the IRS code. And was passed during the Eisenhower administration as a means by which the average person could own a piece of stock in real estate without having the day-to-day -day burden of owning real estate. And uh, uh, as you know, real estate generally has been owned by rich people. And yes. it, this was a way by which uh, uh, people could own uh, different classes of real estate uh, businesses. And then if they didn't, if they wanted to get out, they could just sell their stock. They were intended as uh, dividend instruments. Um, so the REIT doesn't pay corporate income tax so long as they distribute 90% of their net income. Hmm. Hmm. That's it. That's a really good way of describing it. Of course, uh, you would be the best to uh, describe it since you uh, created one. I've been living it for uh, most of your, your career here. So, um, I, I love the idea of a REIT because I am one of those guys that can never afford big real estate. This uh, this little house that I have here on Long Island is my big real estate play of my lifetime, and I've always wanted to get into the hotel business. And it's cool to know that I could buy some shares of the stock at Felcor or another REIT that's out there, and there are several, and feel like I'm participating in that uh, fun and exciting business. And it's one of the aspects of the business I don't think that a lot of people consider as part of the hotel industry when they're outside the financial circles like we are. We think a lot about customer service and the branding aspect of it and the fun travel part of it, but not the fact that it's an actual real estate investment. And that's really where a lot of the money in this business is made. Isn't that correct? Yeah, and it's interesting. If you've watched a trend occur, uh, mostly I'd say through the early 90s to today, where historically most of the major hotel companies up until probably Marriott in the um, in the uh, early 90s split off their real estate companies that, you know, the people see the hotel business as basically in two silos, the operating, si operating silo uh, slash management and the real estate piece. But uh, historically, they were all combined. And since the early 90s, you've seen a, a, a switch where most of the um, – Hotel major hotel companies have become pure operating plays, yep. spun off the real estate, and are primarily uh, managers and franchisors. And most recently, uh, Hilton Worldwide did just such a thing, splitting their company into three divisions: one focusing on real estate, one focusing on the brand, and another focused on the timeshare component. But you started Felcor along with um, Hervey Feldman, who's also the founder of MDC Suites, back in 1991 going from one hotel into a publicly traded company that you are today. What was it like chartering, a, I would say, relatively new territory in the hospitality industry to create something that wasn't commonly known or accepted back then? Yeah, we did it the traditional way uh, when we did our first hotel, which was a Holiday Inn in, um, in, the, uh, in Dallas, Texas, that we bought from the uh, FDIC uh, at about that time. Um, about 25% of all the hotels were owned by the federal government through the savings loan crisis and other things. Mm -hmm. And so they flooded the market with lots of hotels. So people were able to buy hotels for cents on the dollar to wow. the replacement value. And so we were fortunate enough to buy one hotel uh, that the government financed 90% of, uh, a hotel that that uh, had originally cost about 100000 a key. We bought for 10000 a key. Um and so um, it was kind of a really interesting time. In fact, at the, in 91 uh, in Texas, we were going through a fairly big uh, real estate crisis, and there was not a single Texas bank 
left in Dallas, Texas at the time. Are you serious? Not a single one. Land of J.R. Ewing and no banks? How crazy is that? There was no banks. They were all gone. And they all got taken over by uh, by by the national uh, companies, and uh, we raised the money the old fashioned way. We went to doc- doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs <laughs> to get enough equity right. to put up uh, to uh, build the hotel and provide the money for um, doing a product improvement pl- plan for the hotel. Uh, yes, also commonly known as a, an, a as a PIP, one of those uh, industry terms that we throw around a whole lot, and we're seeing tons of that kind of stuff right now as hotels try to get themselves in perfect condition for this new era that we're in. Okay, so you started this, you started this this read, but even before that, I want to go back to the early days of uh, Tom Tom Cochran. You first entered the hotel industry, like many other leaders in this business, um, before you even um, had a chance to go to college because you were younger. Um, then university age, you were still, I guess, in high school because you started what as a hotel dishwasher at age fourteen. Is that right? Fourteen. That was my first job where I actually got a paycheck. Nice. I, I ignore. I know the mowing yards, the shoveling the snow, and what other stuff I did. But it was the first time I actually got a paycheck when I was fourteen as a dishwasher at a Holiday Inn in Topeka, Kansas. What do you, do you remember? What you got paid? Oh, whatever minimum wage was back then, what, a buck? <laughs> I don't know. Not much. Yeah. You know, I my so, first uh my first jobs were um you know, also for minimum wage. But I started we were already making a crazy three thirty an hour and then we got a big race to three thirty five and uh yeah, I, I I felt like a wealthy man after that, you know, all yeah. the uh, all the bubble gum I could have. Well, I just can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, that's anyway. that's all right. But uh, but what I love about the hotel industry is it's really all about um, what you bring to the table. It's what your skill sets are, and how um, no matter what area of life you're in, you could come in and you can achieve. Some of the uh, the top leaders in the hotel industry all started this way. I know that um, uh, Steve Joyce, who runs Choice Hotels, did, and I know um, a number of other guys too did as well. Who I don't want to say because I don't want to get it wrong, but I feel like. Um, you know, Arnie Sorensen might have as well, who runs Marriott and a couple of the other big uh, guys as well. So um, it's pretty interesting. So did you get hooked on the hotel business as a dishwasher at age 14? Or did you, you know, have a uh, have that pop into your brain later on in life? Uh, I actually loved the business from the very beginning. I can't say I loved being a dishwasher, um, but I will tell you that I love the people. I eventually, uh, you know, got promoted to being a a cook. Um, and, uh, but I think, um, back in those days, the holiday inns back in the, in the sixties were, you know, that's before we've had all the fast food restaurants we have today. It mm-hmm. was the hot place to go eat breakfast to people had all their Sunday, uh, events there, all their holidays were there. And so it was the real place to go. And, and, and I, I think I, I get the bug for, just the hospitality business in general. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom was a big cook, and I learned a lot from my mom, uh, but I'm not sure that at that age I really paid attention to her a lot. Uh, I did that much later in life where I actually learned how to cook better from her. But uh, I think all of us that had started out in some line position have, have begin to see the value of the people, the people skills, and just the hospitality um, gene that many of us, I think, are born with that makes us love it. And, and I think more import- importantly, Glenn, is I think one of the, what it does is if you, if you, wherever you start in a hotel, if you work hard, if you show like you have desire and, and you're willing to put out the extra effort, you will be rewarded beyond your wildest imagination because it's that kind of industry. Yes, it really is. And I love it so much because the opportunity is boundless. And, um, you know, uh, for those of you who don't realize it, uh, Tom Corcoran has also served as the chairman of the American Hotel and Lodging Association, the predominant lobbying group in Washington, D.C., um, to make sure that issues for this amazing business are, are certainly cared for. So you have a lot of experience in that political realm up there as well. And your part of that job is always, besides the politics of it, is making sure that the hospitality industry is known as a place for opportunity, as a future place for growth, and as, as a place where any one of us Americans can uh, rise up and achieve success, right? 
Well, true, and I tell you, one of the things that I have enjoyed going up on on the hill and meeting with uh, administration people is that everybody uh, who's a politician has stayed at hotels, and so they have their their stories. and uh, And I, I find a fondness. I, I was amazed one time when I went in. Um, to call on Trent Lott when he was the majority leader of, of the Senate. And, uh, and I mentioned to him that when I had three hotels in Mississippi, his state, and he knew the GM's name of all three hotels. Oh my goodness. And that's what I call connectivity. So the interesting thing about our industry is there is this direct connectivity because to be a politician and to hold office, you've got to run for election, which means you stay in a lot of hotels and motels. And so they're, and, and people usually treat the politicians and the people running for office with respect and take care of them and their staff. So there ends up being a, a fairly strong connection uh, between the hotel people and the uh, politicians. Yet at the same time, I feel like there's some sort of disconnect between the politician's personal experience and then the policies and the legislation that wind up being enacted that don't always benefit the travel industry. Why do you think there's that disconnect sometimes? Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean in terms of, of, I mean, I think that there are, there are most people, uh, that we usually get fairly good bipartisan support Mm -hmm. when we're trying to do advertising or marketing for the U S and for tourism. Very true. But I would also say that that's more recently within the last 10 years or so more since when you became chairman of HLA than previous to that. Yeah, and I think before people didn't recognize that one of the best exports that we have is Mm -hmm. tourism coming into the U.S., and people don't see the direct impact that if you have tourists coming in, it's the greatest export we got. So it's interesting. Um, We're always talking about imports uh, as one of the big problems, but we we want these people, the international tourists, to come into the U.S. and enjoy America. And I think there is a much more respect for that part of it. And I think the other thing is, I think there's a much, since the service industry has been on a fairly high growth rate compared to other industries, there's also more respect today for the number of jobs that we create for people and the opportunities for people uh, to work. And and we've been, as you know, on a fairly Mm -hmm. positive Redfar growth for the last several years. And all of that has meant more employment in our sector which is, and people do understand that we do provide a lot of jobs for people. Yes, and let me throw out a couple of statistics that I'm sure both of us know, but our listeners would be uh, curious about. About one in eight jobs are uh, directly or indirectly related to the travel and hospitality industry. And not only that, but when you're talking about um, the expansion of the hotel industry, it has been the largest um, increase of employers uh, around the country is the travel and hospitality business. So more hospitality jobs have been added than in any other business sector during the uh, the time since the Great Recession. So pretty impressive. The travel industry is super duper important to our economy. But, um, you know, you know, Tom, before we got on the mic, we, we said, were we going to talk about this? Were we not going to talk about this? But the changing administration that may or may not have a deleterious effect on the overall state of the hospitality industry. What do you think some of the challenges are and what do you think might be some of the solutions out there for us to uh, make our way for the next four or eight years? Well, I think that the stock market and businesses in general has been encouraged by the talk of potentially lower taxes and more more spending. And so there's been a there has been a fair amount of positive view and the stock prices of both the the uh, operating companies and the REITs have, have risen uh, since the election of Trump. Mm-hmm. I think that the, the, the issue of the, the, the uncertainties that people are also attempt- dealing with is, is where we finally come down on trade. If we have a trade fight, if we end up ha- having and that, impact, that impact on the embargo, uh, not on the embargo, the impact on immigration. So one, one of the Concerns over the last weekend is is on um, on the on the presidential order was you know exactly how that's going to impact uh, travel and tourism and people coming into the United States and and the answer is what we just don't know but 
but clearly uh, the perception of, of the United States is a great welcoming, great place to come, and how that kind of all comes together uh, along with the other effects that may have positive effects on the economy, you know, is, is uh, you know, it, it, overall it should be good, but there's the unknown that I don't think any of us can actually predict exactly how things are actually going to Yes, get done. that's that's absolutely right. We have no idea how things are going to get done. It's going to be interesting to watch this story um, unfold. Um, one thing I did right after the election, I um, would encourage everyone to check out my YouTube channel. I shot a video on four questions we have to ask in regards to the Trump administration. And one of them is what is its uh, effect going to be on hospitality and tourism for foreigners wanting to come to the United States? So we're going to have to see how that plays out. Um, I know I'm I'm not going to be able to get you to give me a specific opinion on which way you think it could go, but I know that anything we can all do to help promote tourism here is going to be beneficial to uh, all Americans. Right, Tom? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how the hotel business has changed in the years that you've been in it. Not necessarily since you were age 14 washing dishes, um, and not even necessarily since when you opened that first Holiday Inn in Dallas when you started uh, Felcor with Hervey Feldman back in 1991. But in the last 10 or 15 years, how much has it changed to you? And what are some of the new opportunities and challenges that you face um, that you think we're facing going forward? Um, well, I think the big change in the last decade probably has been uh, the number of, of uh, proliferation of brands yeah. and the attempt by the various brands to have various niches within a brand umbrella is probably uh, something that most of us, and I assume the consumer, is seeing that you know now that there's it's either 30 or 31 Marriott branded hotels, um, could be 32, but, but there's a lot. Um, but I, I actually, Glenn, I kind of take it back to the late seventies uh-huh. when, when, uh, when I kind of look back, um, which is more in my time versus the, you know, you had the, you had the early fifties where you, you didn't have hotels built in the United States for a period of 40 and 50 years because of their recession and the war. Yep. And then, and then Kevin's Wilson started, you know, Holiday Inn, and you began to see motels crop up all across America along the interstate uh, highway system. Late seventies, you began to see another trend. Um, this other trend was you you saw the first uh, Embassy Suite, which was started originally as a Granada Royale and merged into Embassy Suite, mm-hmm. which offered a free cooked order breakfast, a two room suite. And, and at the time, you know, that didn't exist before. And that was a different hotel experience for people. Uh, it's hard to believe uh, that uh, Embassy started that. And I've even heard of uh, Granada Royale. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, Granada Royale was actually started by a fellow by the name of Bob Woolley. Mm-hmm. He started in Phoenix, Arizona. And like a lot of deals that start in life, he was not a hotel guy. He was a plumber. <laughs> and this plumber, this plumber took back a hotel uh, because he didn't get paid and tried to figure out what to do with the thing. This building was supposed to be apartment building and decided to call it the Granada Royale. And that's what started the all sweet business. Oh, cool. Um, and of course, embassy has, has basically dominated that business, uh, ever since the late seventies, early eighties. Um, the other b- business that started and again, uh, by a non hotel person was, uh, resident Inn, which was started by Jack DeBoer who was an apartment developer who had an apartment deal that didn't work, but he tried to figure a way to do something with it. And he actually uh, um, started a business that, you know, today there's 800 of them. And what's amazing, always amazing to me is that, you know, I I can remember back in the early 80s, uh, I happened to be involved with it, uh, partly because I was working at Brock Hotel. Mm -hmm. Uh, We actually owned 80% of residents in at the time. And And Brock Hotel was what you did prior to Felcor. That's correct. And Bill Merritt was interviewed, you know, at one of the industry conferences about his extended stay slash resident going to be around for long. And he said, no, it's not going to last that long. It's just, but he obviously later, later bought the company and changed his mind. But (laughs) so a lot of these new concepts that had come out that I call revolutionary to the hotel business have been started by non-hotel people. And, and, Today, I struggle to see 
you know, you've seen limited service that started popping up in the in the late 80s. You begin to see a lot of people, you know, come off with little niches uh, and, and more boutique. But I, but I haven't seen anything as innovative as either the all-suite hotel business or the extended state business in the last 30 or 40 years. So you don't think the um, millennial-focused hotels with little tiny rooms are very uh, innovative compared to 30 or 40 years ago? You don't, well, yeah. <laughs> you don't, have, you don't have to answer I, that directly. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, I, I, I think it's probably – I think I don't think there's such a thing as a millennial hotel. I, think, I don't think um, – Hotel experiences are defined by someone's age. Although I'll tell you a funny story, I went into mm-hmm. I was in New Orleans and I went, went into a new concept that Marriott's doing called uh, Moxie, mm-hmm. uh, which is a brand that's I, I assume is perceived to be a millennial brand. Yes. So when you go in, there's no lobby in the traditional sense, mm-hmm. and the bar is where you check in at the hotel. Nice, I like so that. So your idea. bar. You, so your bartender is your front desk clerk. So I'm walking around the hotel, and uh, uh, there's a vending machine. So they don't have a uh, um, what do you uh, what do you call them? Not a snack bar, but uh, sundry shop. You uh-huh. know, typical. They don't have one. So they have this b- vending machine, and inside the vending machine is a uh, is some hand cream, and and it and I'm I look at it, I say, I can't believe. I don't know if I can say this word, but it you says say on the bo- <laughs> okay, it says on the bottle, hand shit. It's honeysuckle <laughs> sage hand cream, and I thought, hey, my has the world changed that you can go into a Marriott branded hotel and buy and invisibly see the words and buy from this vending machine a uh, hand cream that's called hand shit. That's really funny. And it wasn't all that long ago they were uh, crowing about removing certain types of movies from the hotel. So we... <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. It, it is amazing how uh, fluid society uh, has, has become over, over time. But I like what you, you said. And I want to go back to the point that you made in regards to you don't think hotels should really appeal to a specific age group. I don't think a lot of the hotel developers are understanding that we should be focused more on the way we feel in a hotel as opposed to the certain age of a hotel. And I think the age of the user of the hotel, because I think when you break things down by age groups, it's going to steer you in the wrong direction and set you up for future relevancy. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the whole, I guess my whole point is it, it's about the overall experience mm-hmm. of what you like or what you don't like. And, and uh, um, we used to call them the upstairs downstairs customer, right? The upstairs customer was the person who checked in the lobby, went straight to his room, and didn't come down. And he, and he might order room service, or he might have picked up a six-pack of beer and something and gone to his room, and all, he, 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 that's all he came there for. Mm-hmm. Downstairs person, he checks in, drops his bag, immediately goes downstairs, goes to the bar, and he's a real social person. And I've seen more of the hotels develop more social experiences in the lobby which has been somewhat a change over the last decade. I think if there's one that I can think of where the lobby has become much more of a social occasion. But again, I would argue it's no different than what embassy suites did back when they had free cocktails back in the late seventies, where basically you typically would get 75 to 80% of hotel guests all coming down to the atrium level to, to, to mingle together. Uh, partly because it was mostly because it was free, mm-hmm. but but also I think it, it created that social occasion, and I think that social occasion has now involved where people actually actually like, you know, uh, intermingling more than I think I would have seen um, twenty years ago. You 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 see people sitting at long tables. Um, talking to strangers that you would not, in my view, seen years ago. Yeah, do you think hotels um, should set the stage for personal interactions like that, or does it not need to, to, to worry about that as much? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, people seem to like it. I mean, there's some that, you yeah. know, they want an individual pod, and they don't want him to bother, or they're mm-hmm. working on something personal. Yeah. Uh, but So I think you've got to create both, both environments within hotel lobbies today uh, to the extent you have the space to do it. Yeah, what do you think about... Um, 
technology in the hospitality business. My greatest fear is that we're going to get so caught up with technology, we're going to lose the thing that makes us special. And that's facilitating those individual connections between human beings. So are you thinking about that issue? How would you um, suggest the hotel industry go about adding automation but not losing the uh, personal hand-to-hand relationships? Well, I, I actually, I think, you know, one of, the, one of my worst things I hate walking up to, to, a, to a front desk is the is to look for that first eye to eye welcoming contact. Yeah. And then immediately the, the front desk clerk has got their eyes down looking at the computer screen. That's right. And that, and that's the last time until he or she hands you the key that you'll have, uh, you'll have face to face contact. Mm-hmm. I think all the new technologies that I'm seeing that's going to come is, is I think could, uh, create more opportunities to more face to face. So, so, for example, you pull in, you're a member of IHG Rewards, you pop up on the computer screen at the front desk, Tom Corcoran's arrived at the hotel, they see my profile, they know my room, and they get from behind, because the front desk probably won't be the same front desk that we used to work at, they'll be more like pods or freestanding stations. And the front desk clerk's going to come around, um, assuming my iPhone doesn't mm-hmm. uh, open the uh, door of my hotel room, uh, he or she's going to greet me at the front door, welcome me with with my free bottle of water or whatever. And you could make the experience even better for the customer than in the past. So I think there, you know, if we figure out how to use it right, I think we'll make the experience even more friendly and better to our to our customers. I happen to agree with you a hundred percent because my attitude is um, a lot of the people in the hotel have been so focused on the transactional and not the experiential. And we're at a crossroads now where I have the opportunity to really go down that experiential thing and facilitate great moments for guests, or we can go completely automated and and become irrelevant or commoditized is my biggest fear. Yeah, and it scares me to think that you'd walk, you know, from your car or wherever you get and just walk straight to the room and have zero interaction um, with anybody at the hotel. Uh, and maybe some days you feel like you don't want to talk to anybody, yep. but, but I still think, uh, I think it's important that, because uh, I don't think you have hospitality if you don't have interaction. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what makes the whole hospitality experience. And I've said this before on the show. I've said it plenty of times on stage, but it always bears uh, re- repeating. True memories and experiences are created by your interactions with people, not by a nice bedspread, not by that great looking desk in the room, but those one on one meaningful interactions. And we can never, ever lose sight of that, because if we do, we're, we're, we're all dead. Right. Well, right. I was thinking, you know, it's. Um... What, you know the person that most people remember at the embassy suite mm-hmm. more than any other person? I'm going to say the, the cook. The cook? It's the cook. Ah, I was going to say bartender, cook. but you're right. The guy that's making my omelet in the morning. Yeah, and, and, and that cook's a great cook. has got that great personality. Mm-hmm. You know, it's in the more. I mean, that cook, I mean, I've seen some fantastic <laughs> cooks with personalities that yeah. people uh, just absolutely love. Yeah. So that's that's a great tip right there. Um, if you're a hotel owner or operator, invest in great people that have direct interactions with the guests, such as the bartender and that morning cook. All right, Tom, before we wrap up, you've been around the block a couple of times. You've got lots of experience. What would you tell all of those uh, young folks that are that are coming up, want to make a life in hospitality or have embarked on a career in hospitality and want to look back and say, I did just like Tom did and got to a great a great place in life? Um, be willing to, to take a job uh, working for the right person and not because it's the right amount of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, my, my experience has been that if you are fortunate enough to interview, you should be interviewing the person that's going to hire you or the person you're going to work for and look for the right person that's going to make you uh, where you can learn more and make you a better person. And, uh, in early in your career, I mean, I was lucky to have somebody, um, and I think that was the best decision I ever made, was having the right p- person take me under their arm and, and really show me the ropes and help me, and it's been paid dividends for decades. Is there any particular lesson that you learned early on that still resonates with you today? 
Work, well, I think working hard probably. Um, I mean, I always said I, I, I didn't get the, the the highest grades in school, um, but but I but I would say I would outwork most anybody, um, and that's probably uh, a key to my success is be, being willing to uh, work extremely hard and do whatever it took to get the job done. So, at what point do you start to balance? getting the job done and having a life outside of work? Because I think more and more that's an issue that uh, younger people find important to them. Work is not life. I have, I'm of the, uh, you know, work is your life generation. But I'm finding that uh, younger folks, I don't know if it's a smarter approach to life, but they definitely wanted things well balanced. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm a big believer in balancing family and, and work. And I think it's got to be something that you consciously think about. But, but I think if it depends what you you know if 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 you have a desire to succeed, I think you got to work at it. If you, you want to have a mm-hmm. great social life, uh, family life, um, you got to work at it too. And so you can't do one without the other. You got to balance the two and work at it. But I mean, the 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 there's some people who think that some of the millennials believe that. Once they've worked for a year or two, they ought to be the CEO of the company because they <laughs> they know everything. Yes, that's right. And and and, and you know my 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 point is it's not going to probably happen that way. So you're always going to be disappointed in life. You ought to set your expectations up, you know, to to grow not from um, a line level job to the CEO job in two years or less. You ought to shoot for a next reasonable goal and and set interim goals that are achievable doesn't mean you can't exceed those goals, but you, but you can't expect to get to the top uh, that quickly. It's going to just take more time in the real world. Beautiful. Uh, I love it. Anything that you would like to leave us with before we uh, wrap up officially? Um, yeah, my decoupage. Enjoy life, employ <laughs> life. It flits away and will not stay. Excellent. How about a, a shameless plug? How do we uh, learn about Felcor? Give me uh, one or two of your, your favorite hotels in the system that people should be staying at. Uh, the Vinoy in St. Petersburg, Florida, built in the early 1900s, is absolutely a spectacular Wait, the Vinoy is yours? Uh-huh. I had no idea. I love that hotel. And uh, I just is. recently made a, a, a friend on Facebook with uh, with the chef over there. Really? Yeah. Well, it's a great, I mean, it's, it's a, again, you talk about great experiences, and you go through the hallways, and you see kind of the old with the new so you get it's, it's just a spectacular hotel um and then the newest one we opened up was the knickerbocker 42nd broadway mm-hmm. which has got a rooftop bar and lounge that is really spectacular and again it was a hotel that was built uh, by john jacob astor and uh, uh believe it or not was close uh, as a hotel from 1922 uh, to 2015 Yep. When it reopened wow. as a hotel. So it's Jeez, I another believe, great experience. I can't believe it's been a year and a half already, I guess, since that. Yeah, it is. Oh, I, know. I know. Holy Cazoli. I was following the progress of that because uh, my um, industry colleague friend, uh, Lori Patton, did all the purchasing on that project for yeah. you guys. Yeah, so I got to I got to hear about that as it was going on. It really, really cool. Another great project. And uh, Felcor Lodging Trust, I suggest you guys look at them. They are a hospitality industry REIT. Like we said at the beginning of the call, if you're interested in investing in the hospitality industry, check these guys out um, as a good real estate play. Now, I'm not asking him to make any comments on that. That's my recommendation because uh, I think you probably want to keep clear of uh, pushing it in that kind of way. Right there? Right, Tom? Anything, right. anything, anything else? All right. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank you for being here with me today, and I want to thank everybody for listening today. What a great time I had speaking to Tom, and I'm glad that I am now over my fears, and the next time I see you, I'll be able to uh, handle being in your presence a a, a little bit more. So that's it for me today. I want to thank you for listening to the No Vacancy Podcast, and I will be back next week. That is, unless I decide to get a job cooking eggs at the Embassy Suites. Thanks, guys, and see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.